Good morning. The open meeting of the Federal Election Commission for June 24th, 2021 will come to order. We have some late submitted documents this morning. Commissioner Trainer. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I move to suspend the rules on the timely submission of agenda documents in order that the commission may consider the late submission of agenda documents number 21-30-A and 21-30-B. Thank you. Commissioner Trainer has so moved. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Madam Secretary, Commissioner Trainer's motion has been adopted by a vote of 5-0. Five, uh, five uh, I will note for the record today that the vice chair is unable to attend the meeting and will be submitting votes um, by the close of evening pursuant to the directive 10. So the motion has passed. Um, the next item, the first item on the agenda, excuse me, is advisory opinion request 2021-06 submitted on behalf of Representative Robin Kelly and the Democratic Party of Illinois. We are joined today by Charles Borden, Borden excuse me, and Sam Brown who are available to respond to questions that commissioners may have. So Mr. Borden and Mr. Brown, I say welcome today. I think for particularly one of you, it is a, a welcome back and I'm sure Commissioner Weintraub will highlight that for you. We also have Heather Filmeyer and Rob Knopp, um, Robert Knopp, excuse me, from OGC here to discuss the matter. And I turn to OGC, um, Council. Thank you, Madam Chair and good morning, commissioners. Before you are agenda documents 21-30-A and 21-30-B, alternative draft advisory opinions responding to a request from US Congresswoman Robin Kelly and the Democratic Party of Illinois. Representative Kelly was recently elected to serve as chair of the Democratic State Central Committee, which governs the state party. Requesters ask whether adopting one of three proposed governance structures during Congresswoman Kelly's tenure as chair would permit the state party to raise and spend funds through its non-federal account in amounts and from sources prohibited by the act, but permitted under Illinois law. The requesters further ask whether the Congresswoman's name and title as chair may be included on the letterhead of solicitations for the non-federal account. Draft A concludes that the state party would be prohibited from raising and spending funds in amounts and from sources prohibited by the act under any of the proposed government's governance structures because Congresswoman Kelly would retain indirect control over the non-federal account. Given that conclusion, the letterhead question is moot. Draft B concludes the state party may raise funds in amounts and from sources prohibited by the act, but permitted under Illinois law through its non-federal account if both the non-federal account is administered by a special committee without the review or approval of Congresswoman Kelly, and the majority of the special committee's members are automatically appointed to the special committee by virtue of holding a specific office not appointed by the chair. Draft B further concludes that Congresswoman Kelly's name and title as chair must not be included on the letterhead of any solicitation that solicits funds and amounts and from sources prohibited by the act because using her name and title in that manner would identify the solicitation as being sent on Congresswoman Kelly's behalf in violation of the act's soft money prohibition. We did not receive any comments on the request we received one comment on the drafts. Thank you, and I will be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there, is there any discussion or do commissioners have any questions for council? Madam Chair. Commissioner Cooksey. Um, as as I am usually want to do, given that we have uh, representatives for the uh, requester here, I would, uh, like to hear their views, I guess, on, on both drafts and any initial comments uh, they might have before commissioner questions. Thank you very much, commissioner. And, and we'd like to start just by thanking all the commissioners for your time and for your consideration uh, of the request. Uh, and also thank the, the staff for your assistance uh, with the entire process. So I'd just like to say at the outset that our goal in seeking this advisory opinion is not to weaken BICRA, uh, to create an exception to BICRA, or to facilitate the ability of a federal office holder to solicit non-federal funds. Instead, what we're doing here is um, seeking to address a situation that has come up, a fact pattern that has come up uh, a, a number of times since BICRA was adopted. 
but that has never uh, been the subject of formal uh, commission guidance. And that is the fact pattern of having a sitting federal office holder uh, as the chair of a state party. And so what we're really uh, seeking to do is have the commission apply its uh, longstanding precedents and its regulations to this fact pattern, um, considering uh, the structural proposals um, that we have put forward in the advisory opinion request. And I think uh, today what we're really gonna focus on is the first of those proposals, the special committee. Um, which would be a committee composed, a majority of which would be composed of individuals who hold uh, a seat on that committee by virtue of holding another office. So these are individuals who are um, fully insulated from Congresswoman Kelly's control, uh, whom she could not select, whom she could not terminate. And I think our view is that with this type of structure in place, and in view of the fact that that special committee would have complete and total responsibility for the management uh, direction, uh, fundraising and all other aspects of the non-federal account. Um, our view is that uh, the uh, Congresswoman would not be deemed to control the non-federal account. Um, we do support for those reasons uh, draft B and we would urge uh, the committee uh, to adopt that draft. And we're, we're ready to get into specifics of any of the individual regulations or to address any questions that the commissioners might have. Thank you, Council. Any additional questions for Council? I see none. Is there a motion then? M Madam Chair. Mr. Trainer. I, I, do, I do have a few questions uh, with, re with regard to that for uh, Council for the Illinois party. So um, you, you said that you prefer draft B. Um, what is your view of the legal analysis with regard to uh, draft A um, and, and why it's not correct? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. So I think to address that, it's probably most useful to go through uh, the four criteria that draft A applies. Uh, to this fact pattern and to discuss why we think uh, that its conclusions are ultimately uh, unfounded. And at the outset, I'd just like to note that when, when um, analyzing this fact pattern, uh, we are proposing to uh, significantly revise the committee's bylaws. Um, so while we did include at the request of staff, the existing bylaws for reference of the commission, um, we're proposing a totally new structure. And along with that structure, we're proposing a number of governance measures, including uh, trainings and annual certifications um, to ensure that that structure is adhered to. And uh, just to run through them. So, and again, I'm gonna be focused on the special committee option since that's the one that is the focus of the two drafts. There are really four uh, principal criteria that draft A goes through in concluding uh, that the special committee structure would nonetheless result in the uh, Congresswoman controlling the non-federal account. The first of these is uh, the governance uh, point. And at the outset, we'd note that the special committee, which again is composed of a majority of individuals who would hold uh, their seat on that um, uh, committee by virtue of holding another office. And so in that sense would not be subject to the direction or control of the chair. You know, We're talking about the speaker of the Illinois House of Representatives, for example, who holds that office for other reasons and is not uh, at all someone who can be dismissed from that role by Congresswoman Kelly. So that special committee composed of the majority of those individuals would have total authority over the governance of the non-federal account. Just to underscore that, the Congresswoman in her role as chair would not have any governance authority with respect to the non-federal account. Um, draft A refers to the central committee members as potentially providing an avenue for the chair to have to exert control. Um, over the non-federal account, but uh, once the bylaws have been revised, those central committee members will not have a, a role in connection with the non-federal account. Just to reiterate something I've mentioned a few times, it is the special committee that would have exclusive authority. And um, uh, it's also the case that all of the employees of the party who work on non-federal matters would ultimately and exclusively uh, be subject to oversight and direction and, and, and potential termination for their non-federal account work um, to the special committee. 
So in other words, none of those employees would, the chair would not have the ability to fire, to review, to direct, uh, none of those things um, with respect to um, party employees who are working on non federal account matters. So uh, we think given that, if you apply the, the, the regulations of the committee that address governance, it's clear that it is the special committee and not the chair that has governance authority over the non federal account. The second of the four uh, criteria is personnel. And here again, um, it's clear that because all of the personnel of the party who are uh, working on non-federal account matters are subject to the supervision oversight of the special committee and not the chair, um, she does not have the ability to influence the non-federal account um, through her oversight over personnel. And the, the commission has long recognized in other contexts that it's possible for someone to supervise an employee with respect to one set of activities, but not with respect to another set of activities. That's just absolutely core to the commission's approach to foreign national uh, involvement in elections. And we're really asking for that same type of analysis, and we would expect the commission to apply that same type of analysis here to allow the special committee to exert that oversight and direction over party employees when they're dealing with um, uh, personnel who are working on the, the non-federal account. And the other two criteria uh, in the commission ranks, draft A actually finds uh, with respect to funding and formation, and we would agree with this, that those criteria weigh against a finding of control. Um, so we've got governance, personnel, funding, and formation. And if we look at all four of those, we think all four of them weigh against a finding of control, given the special committee structure that we're proposing to set up and we're proposing to put the law. You know, just, and it, it, this is not, uh, this is more as a matter of background and not directly relevant to applying these regulations. But if we think about the policy that animates BICRA and the type of fact pattern that, that uh, gave rise to the soft money ban, we're thinking about a situation where a federal office holder is able to uh, solicit um, non-federal funds from an individual. Um, they're then able to uh, be involved in directing the spending of those funds. Uh, and then finally, they might feel some sense of obligation or duty or beholdenness um, to the individual who provided those non-federal funds. And the concern is that that all presents a risk of corruption or the appearance of corruption um, involving the federal office holder. Well, here, the chair is not gonna be involved in any of those activities. She is not gonna have anything to do with uh, soliciting non-federal funds. Uh, she won't be involved in interacting with donors who are giving non-federal funds. She won't be involved in spending non-federal funds. So uh, all of the decisions regarding making contributions out of the non-federal account, uh, relating to spending in, in state races from the non-federal account, advertising, um, uh, regarding you know, terminating someone who does a bad job on, on that sort of non-federal spending, all of those things are the sole and exclusive province of the special committee. And the chair is both uh, um, insulated from those activities and she's subject to a detailed governance regime to make sure uh, that she abides by that restriction. And, and given that, we think that it's clear if you apply those regulations that there is no control for purposes of big run. So how long, how long have the current bylaws that you have submitted been in place? I would have to get back to you on that. I think that they were amended somewhat recently, but um, uh, they've in in core they've been around for a significant period of time. But we can we can. Uh, so do you, do you find it? Please go. Ahead. Do you find it problematic at all that we're that we find ourselves in a situation where Bikra is dictating to a private association how they? have to organize their bylaws in order to uh, be able to run their operations? Uh, Commissioner, we are uh, comfortable as representatives of the party with a situation in which the chair is uh, separated from those activities. So um, I think that that kind of question is really sort of beyond the scope of our request, I suppose I would say. So it, it, it really, then that gets to my question of, of, do you really think we have jurisdiction to be able to dictate what the bylaw structure of a private association like the Illinois party would be? Uh, Commissioner, I take your point. Uh, I think in the specific context of this advisory opinion request, um, your jurisdiction is founded on the fact that we have voluntarily presented a specific fact pattern um, and we're asking for the commission to confirm that if we abide by that fact pattern, um, we will not be found by the commission to have violated uh, BICRA or FICA. 
Um, and so just for that, uh, you know, within that context of that uh, sort of request, we think that there is a jurisdiction. Um, and certainly, I think as a practical matter, um, if the commission was unable to render an opinion uh, as a result of concerns about jurisdiction, um, that would uh, make things quite challenging for the party uh, going forward um, and would introduce a level of complexity really for any state party that has an equivalent uh, situation. And so I think uh, while I, I certainly recognize the points that you're raising um, and, and find those to be uh, very interesting, I think uh, for purposes of this uh, practical advisory opinion request, um, uh, our concern is to have our, our specific fact pattern uh, addressed uh, in, in a sense that gives us some uh, assurance as to the state of the law going forward. Now, uh, Congresswoman Kelly is currently serving as the chair or is she incoming? She has already been elected as chair, yes. She's currently so is the, is the party currently engaged? Is, is the party currently engaged in fundraising activities or have they suspended all fundraising activities? The party has suspended all non-federal fundraising activities pending the resolution of this issue. Okay. And if the commission is unable to render an opinion uh, with regard to this, would the party just continue to uh, not raise funds or, or what would your next step be? You know, Commissioner, I think we'd have to evaluate the specific context of that failure to render an opinion. Um, I, we would want to take a look at, at the uh, particular events that occurred and try to assess them in light of the Commission's past precedents and regulations. But that being said, let me be very clear. Uh, we have a very strong interest in having this issue resolved and having it resolved uh, on an expedited basis uh, so that the party can return to its core party activities of working to elect Democrats up and down the ticket. So tell me what the day-to-day -day activities for Congresswoman Kelly would be if she's going to be excluded from what, what I see as probably a core function of a state party, which is uh, the raising of funds to support uh, the candidates of, of the particular party. Um, what does is, what is her day-to-day -day role within the party become if she doesn't have the ability to make hiring and firing decisions of this specific group of people uh, and yet they have such a, an extreme influence over the activities of what the party engages in? Certainly, Commissioner, and that's, that's an excellent uh, question. Um, she would uh, obviously still have authority over the federal account and the, the essentially the hard money uh, aspects of the party. And I think she would also serve as the, the, the figurehead and the leader of the party. Um, this, uh, this structure in this opinion would not at all affect her ability to campaign uh, and to advocate for the party and for Democrats up and down the ticket. Um, and I think there is a real value here. And I, I suppose this gets to um, why uh, this is relevant to party operations beyond the application of BICRA. But we think there's a value here, and this is reflected in uh, the Congressional Black, Black Caucus's um, comment that they, that they issued on having... Uh, members of Congress and other federal office holders have that ability to play an important role uh, in, in uh, party operations and, and to be closely uh, working with um, people on the state level. Um, Congresswoman Kelly's vision for the Illinois Democratic Party is a sort of inclusive, uh, open, um, collaborative structure. That's what she's uh, hoping to achieve. And, and it's her belief that she can achieve that um, by being the, the head of the party, uh, by campaigning, by getting to know and work with people all throughout the state, and also by directing the federal activities of the party. So if, if we were to adopt draft A, uh, do you think state parties would be less likely to look to federal office holders to serve as uh, chairs of their particular parties? Uh, yes, I do, sir. Commissioner. Um, and then how burdensome is it going to be on the Illinois party to have to maintain um, two different, I mean, it, it, we're going so far here is that you have to maintain two different sets of letterhead. Um, and, you, you know, Congresswoman Kelly can't appear on even a particular letterhead. So how burdensome 
is that going to be to the Illinois party um, as far as both internal operations and expenses thrust upon uh, the party? Well, Commissioner, um, some of those burdens in our view are really inherent to the structure of BICRA. So having the party uh, already operate as separate committees, a non-federal account and a, and a federal account, um, that division is already um, reflected in the party's uh, structure and operations. Um, there would be some additional burden. Um, we would have the, obviously the need to establish the special committee. Um, we would have the uh, need to have the trainings and uh, also the you know, certifications and the other governance structures that we're proposing to adopt. Um, but our view is that uh, those uh, burdens are well worth uh, the candle of um, having Congressman Kelly be able to serve as chair and also uh, having that um, structure in place. And, and we also feel, uh, you know, and I think this is uh, clear in the request and um, there's another point that, that's included in the Congressional Black Caucus comment letter that I'd like to echo. Um, uh, the, the party in Congresswoman Kelly absolutely supports uh, BICRA and the soft money divide. That's why um, we're not seeking in this advisory opinion to weaken those rules or to create, carve out an exception to those rules. We're, we're seeking to uh, develop an accommodation to those rules that allows her to um, uh, function in this role while keeping those important anti-corruption uh, protections in place. That, that's, that's our view. Uh, in, in your your point about creating the carve out there, do you know of any other state party committees that have faced a similar situation and how they may have dealt with it? Uh, I there are other state parties that have had and and, and do have uh, sitting federal office holders as chair. I wouldn't want to be in a position to speculate exactly as to the circumstances of those parties. We're we're representing the Illinois Democrat Party, and we we just uh, would prefer to only address our specific background. Okay, do you think we're creating a rule here that, that this would be the only way that state parties could uh, deal with this situation? Uh, Commissioner, uh, I do not. I think that um, given the nature of the advisory opinion request process, um, and also given the, the uh, language of draft B, and I think draft B is attentive to this, um, uh, all that we would be doing is saying in this, given these facts, uh, Bikra would not prohibit, uh, you know, the Congresswoman would not control the non-federal account and uh, um, there would be no uh, restriction on the non-federal account raising and spending funds in excess of federal limits. So all that we're saying is up to this point, uh, you are consistent with the law. I think that the commission would be able in, 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 in the future to consider other requests or other uh, proposed approaches. Uh, these are the ones that, that we uh, are offering. And, and so I think you, your hands would not be tied. In that respect. Okay. And Congresswoman Kelly is a resident of Illinois, I assume, correct? Uh, that is correct, Commissioner. And what could you like roughly guess at what percentage of non federal funds the Illinois State Party receives uh, interstate versus what it receives intrastate? I'm sorry, Commissioner, I, I do not have access to those figures and I haven't performed that analysis, so I'd be hesitant to speculate. Okay, uh, but Congresswoman Kelly is elected to her position as a function of state law, uh, or is she just elected as a function of the operation of the party? It's, I believe it's the intersection of state law and the party's own structures, but it's effectively a state law uh, function, Commissioner. So she's, elect, she's elected under state law and she's a resident of Illinois and uh, there, there may be the possibility that, uh, you haven't done the analysis, but there may be the possibility that all, that all or some of the non-federal funds are coming intrastate as opposed to interstate. Is that correct? Commissioner, all those points are correct. And I think, I think certainly at least some portion of of the non-federal funds that the party receives come from within the state of Illinois. So would it be, would it be possible to carve out the intrastate elements versus the interstate elements and say that this all operates as a function of state law uh, and not as a function of BICRA? 
Commissioner, that's an interesting proposal. Um, we haven't given that significant amounts of thought and uh, our current um, request is presented that does not include that element. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate it and, and sorry to have so many questions for you uh, this morning, but uh, uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, that's all the questions I have. I, I did have one comment uh, with regard to uh, Congressman Meek's uh, comments on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus and, and did want to publicly thank him. Uh, I think it's important that the FEC receive uh, public comments on things like this. And while Congressman Meeks and I may not see eye to eye on all aspects of campaign finance regulation, uh, I think it's uh, delightful that in this particular instance that we agree that the requesters shouldn't be prohibited from engaging in the type of conduct that they have at issue, um, even though I, I may not be fully there on uh, draft B yet, but uh, I do appreciate Congress Meeks and Congressman Meeks and, and the Congressional Black Caucus for uh, weighing in on this issue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Trainer. Um, let me open it up to my colleagues before I, I had a few questions and want to jump in. Okay, well, I will. Um, I want to join Commissioner Trainer in thanking Congressman Meeks and the Congressional Black Caucus PAC for submitting their comment. I found it quite helpful. Um, and I appreciate their strong statement that they are support of FICRA and campaign finance laws. And in fact, that they were the members at the time when FICRA was implemented, a, a high proponent of the members of the, of the Congressional Black Caucus were voting in favor of that. So I found the comment also um, very important, fruitful, and thank you for sending it. And I hope they continue to submit comments to the future for whatever they feel is relevant. But I had some factual questions um, that's going through in draft A. So the issue is not just direct, but indirect control. So I think, and, and just help me understand if this is correct, Congressman Kelly would retain authority. This is in the government section of draft A, and it's going to be on page 10 of that if you need the reference for it. Congressman, Congresswoman, excuse me, Kelly would retain authority over the governance of the non-federal account is what the draft A says through the appointment of central committee members and special committee members. But the comment has been, or the statements have been that she would not appoint a majority. Is that correct? Uh, Chair, that is correct. She would, uh, um, well, let me actually pull apart a couple of different strands there. Um, one, uh, once the bylaws are revised to reflect the proposed governance structure contained in, in option one, uh, the central committee officers would not have any role uh, related to the non-federal account. That would be the exclusive purview of the special committee. So the reference to central committee officers in our view is misplaced. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with respect to the special committee members, um, a, under option one, a majority of those individuals would sit um, by virtue of holding other office, generally legislative leadership offices. Uh, Congresswoman Kelly would have the ability to appoint a minority of the special committee, though, if it is dispositive to the commission's consideration of this issue, uh, the party would also be open to a structure under which all of the special committee members serve by virtue of holding other offices and, and, commission, con and Congresswoman Kelly uh, appointed no member of the special committee. So that is something the party would be willing uh, to incorporate into its structure if that is relevant to the commission's decision. So by the, the fact that you would be willing to incorporate that, are you acknowledging that there is some indirect control by the fact that she would have the ability to appoint not the majority, but the minority of the individuals? Uh, in our view, the ability to appoint a minority of the special committee members in and of itself, if it provided that she otherwise uh, is completely insulated from non-federal account activities, uh, is insufficient to give uh, Congresswoman Kelly uh, control. Uh, we think that clear, clearly- Indirect in, control. Indirect control, yes. Uh, we think that in that case, the special committee, a majority would still uh, be composed entirely of, uh, uh, excuse me, allow me to restate, a majority of the special committee uh, would hold that position by virtue of holding other offices. Um, and. Uh, Generally, when the commission analyzes questions of control, it looks to uh, the particularly when there's a single governing body like a board of directors or, or a, another type of structure like that, a multi-member governing body. 
it looks to the composition of a majority of that governing body. Um, uh, that being said, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the party is certainly willing to uh, ensure that uh, Congresswoman Kelly appoints no one to the special committee if that is dispositive to your decision. Thank you. And also the draft day also highlighted the personnel um, and the draft on page 11 says, Congresswoman Kelly would retain general authority granted by the bylaw to hire staff and appoint officers who may work on the non-federal account and to dismiss and discipline who work on the non-federal for reasons unrelated. Uh, but it's still touching on to personnel, which is one of the factors that is outlined in the statute. Is there some measure of, of resolving that as you've attempted to suggest for the appointments of the special committee? Um, well, I think that uh, we're not proposing any uh, changes to that um, structure beyond what's already in option one. And then let me just address, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chair, the point that you raised because I think it's a good one. Um, under this proposal, while uh, Congresswoman Kelly would be able to hire staff who, who later might go on at some subsequent point in time to work on non-federal account activities, because she's to have no involvement um, with the uh, non-federal account, our view is that she would not be hiring individuals specifically to work on the non-federal account. Um, we just don't wanna um, make it so that every time someone's going to work on non-federal account activities, you have to go back and confirm that they ha had not uh, previously been hired uh, uh, by the chair. But the um, oversight of uh, state party personnel who are working on non-federal account issues is entirely gonna be in the hands of the special committee. And so the chair is not gonna have any, any role whatsoever in, in reviewing, in directing, uh, in, in terminating and doing annual performance reviews in it really any aspect of uh, the management and oversight uh, of personnel that are working on uh, those issues in, in, in connection with the non-federal account. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the commission has, has long recognized that it's possible to supervise an employee with respect to one set of duties and not with respect to another set. So if we're talking about someone who's working solely on non-federal account matters, they're not gonna be subject to any management or supervision at all uh, uh, by the chair. If we're talking about someone who has some mixture of duties. Um, let's take, uh, for example, if there were an in-house uh, council and, and they had uh, roles that related to the non-federal account and roles that related to the federal account, she could only supervise them uh, with respect to the federal account. And if we're thinking of addressing the risk of corruption uh, or the appearance of corruption that, that Bicker tries to address, I think it's just extremely attenuated uh, to say that there's a risk that someone might give uh, funds in excess of federal limits and that those funds might go to someone who is working on, you know, those funds will go to the party and then someone at the party is gonna be working on those issues. And even though the chair is trained and makes an annual certification and is 100% not able to be involved in that person's activity at all, that still somehow that donation from an unrelated third party because of her oversight of party personnel that are working on other issues uh, presents a risk of corruption or the appearance of corruption. That, in our view, is just too attenuated of a chain of causation to present a meaningful risk under big growth. Chair, hopefully that uh, answers your question. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, can you explain to me, and, and you probably already have, but just asking you to say it again, how you believe the draft A precludes the federal candidates or officers from participating in state affairs? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, I'm, if, if we created the impression that draft A would completely preclude federal officers from participating in state affairs, uh, that, that wasn't our intent. I think uh, the question from Commissioner Trainer had been about whether uh, it would affect the ability of federal office holders to serve as chair of state parties. Um, and given that I think we've attempted to present, in our view, a, a very conservative structure and one that includes a lot of safeguards and protections, um, if the commission nevertheless found uh, that uh, there was indirect control despite that structure, I think it would be difficult for other state parties to develop us, uh, alternatives that would nonetheless insulate appropriately a chair from the non-federal account. So I think as a practical matter that would make it quite challenging for uh, other federal office holders to serve in significant roles, I would say, with state parties. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't have any further questions right now. I wanna open it up to my colleagues. Madam Chair, if, if nobody else 
has any questions. I have Actually, one follow-up just from I, something. That... We'll go back to you, Commissioner Trainer, um, Commissioner Weintraub. You, there is a tag team on who, so that we can just hear Perfect. our different voice, <laughs> and then we feel free to, to join in after she is. Um, any questions? Perfect. Commissioner Thank Weintraub? you. Mm -hmm. Of course. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown and Mr. Borden. Um, uh, as the chair alluded earlier, in the interest of full disclosure, a number of years ago, Mr. Brown worked for me. Uh, he always gave me excellent counsel when he worked for me, and I think everyone can see what a terrific lawyer he is. Um, having said that, uh, I, I do have concerns about uh, this request, although I appreciate the care and the ingenuity that went into crafting it. Um, I'm I'm worried about what kind of precedent uh, uh, this might set and what it, what other activity it might open the door to. Do you think that a uh, federal office holder could take on the role of chair of a hybrid PAC that had a uh, hard money account and was also had a super fun, super PAC super, fun, super PAC account? Uh, uh, as long as they set up this kind of um, special committee to supervise the uh, the soft money account? Uh, Commissioner, that's an, an excellent question. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's a, one that we, you know, that's a slightly different fact pattern. And I don't think we've fully thought through all the ramifications of that. I think typically when someone uh, functions as uh, chair of a PAC, um, oftentimes that's a ceremonial role or there's a board of directors for that PAC. So I'm trying to think of what the, really what the equivalent to a state party chair is really in connection with the hybrid PAC. But I, I certainly, we, the, we did not intend, and I, I think draft B is consistent with this intent to open the door uh, to other types of structures outside of the state party context. This was intended to be very tailored to uh, state party organizations and is not intended to have uh, broader ramifications for other types of political entities, particularly those that um, that are different uh, and that may, may have uh, been developed after Citizens United and the other cases uh, that that were that followed Citizens United. So, um, I think the answer is no. Um, uh, if if it's uh, helpful in the draft to include language to that effect, we would certainly support that. Um, I also think a hybrid pack in some ways is there's a there are closer linkages between the uh, unregulated um, uh, you know I, don't, I hesitate to call it soft money because it's almost a different beast uh, super pack side of the hybrid pack and and the hard money uh, um, pack and I think it may pose some real uh, it, it may practically be impossible for anyone to serve in that role given those close linkages and the way that they're intertwined. Um, but I don't, I, I prefer to sort of focus on the, the specific fact pattern that we have here. Um, and as we mentioned at the outset, this is a fact pattern that, that does come up of chairs serving in these roles of state parties. So uh, for better or worse, we're, we're not in a, in, a, in a position where this is a future hypothetical. This is a, uh, and I recognize the challenge that that presents that you're presented with um, uh, facts on the ground that that uh, you know, state parties have done this and, and are looking for guidance that maybe if the, if the commission had the opportunity to draft a set of regulations uh, in advance and didn't wasn't addressing this through the advisory opinion process. I'm not sure that when the BICRA regulations were drafted that uh, this type of arrangement was uh, at the forefront of people's thoughts. But uh, when we do apply those regulations, when we apply the regulations that do exist, I think that it's clear that uh, the conclusion has to be that she does not control the not federal account. Sorry, that was a somewhat rambling uh, answer there, Commissioner. My apologies. No, thank you. I, uh, I, I always appreciate your thoughts, Mr. Brown. Uh, I, I, I can assure you, I'm not going to be coming back with a request from a hybrid pack to. <laughs> Don't know. make promises. <laughs> you never know who's the next client who's going to walk in the door. <laughs> I'll turn that client down. Uh, I may not. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brown. That, that's all I have right now, Ms. Madam Chair. Commissioner Training, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Brown, if, if the commission were to, well, first of all, um, Congresswoman Kelly is, is clearly the choice of 
the Democratic Party uh, in Illinois to lead the party. But if we were to tie the hands of the party with regard to this fundraising, um, is there a provision in state law that allows her to uh, resign and for there to be a new chair elected so that the party could continue to function? Um, I, I think that, uh, that Commissioner, that's an interesting question. Um, I believe that she would be able to resign. And if she were able to resign and someone who is not a federal office holder uh, were to take that position, uh, then these issues would be moot. Um, but she has a vision for the, for the party, for the Democratic Party of Illinois. And that is a vision that has attracted the support of people from all uh, corners of the party. And I think that it would be a real shame if uh, given all the links that she's willing to go to in, in terms of accommodating the structure, if she was not able to have a chance to deliver on that vision for the people of Illinois. I, I agree with you on that point. I think it's, I think it's very important for uh, the members of the party to be able to select their leadership and, and not have their hands tied. Uh, in these type of uh, instances. You had mentioned in your uh, back and forth with uh, the chair, the assertion about uh, Congresswoman Kelly being able to supervise uh, with, in respect to employees, uh, but not with regard to the non-federal funds. How does how is that line drawn, and how do, how are you going to make sure that it doesn't get crossed? I think that um, we will, if the commission does approve this special committee approach, and does recognize that division, we will look to the commission's long precedence in terms of, uh, um, particularly corporate uh, um, uh, oversight of a PAC where some foreign nationals uh, are involved in the corporation, some some. Uh, uh, members of the board or other individuals involved or foreign nationals. And the commission has developed a, a clear structure um, for, with a lot of guidance um, for ensuring that, that that supervision is limited. So essentially, um, uh, and we can get into some of the details, but if you're having an annual review, um, if the person only has non-federal account duties, then they're not gonna be subject to an annual, annual review by the chair. Uh, if they have hybrid duties, she's only going to review them with respect to their federal uh, um, account activities, and the special committee uh, would review them with respect to the non-federal account activities. So there's a division, and that division is um, uh, sort of really emphasized for all parties in involved um, by the regular trainings and by the need uh, that they will be very aware of to certify uh, on an annual basis that they complied with these restrictions. So we would develop, we would build on the commission's existing precedent in this space and, and have a, a, a sort of set of rules around that. And I think what we found in the, in the corporate PAC context is that that's a very feasible and extremely workable approach um, uh, that uh, people generally do not have a, a problems implementing. I appreciate that. Um, you, in your submission, you had two other alternatives to the select committee uh, which we have not addressed uh, primarily because uh, we get we, they get to an answer on the first question. But would you mind going through the other two alternatives that you proposed uh, as being available and how those might work, uh, particularly the second one? Um, sure. So the 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 I believe the second one is the vice chair. So the vice chair. Yes. Um, it's very similar to the special committee model, except that um, it, it has a single individual rather than a, a, a multi-member board. Um, it, it, the vice chair in that, in that question would basically be one person who is solely responsible for the non-federal account activities. Um, in all other respects, um, uh, it, it is similar to the option one. I think that our goal in, provide, in presenting three options was to give the, the commission a range of uh, potential the structures to, to choose between. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, because as you say, is because the commission um, in, in draft B uh, addresses the special committee structure, that's the one we focused on. Um, but we think it's also feasible to have a similar structure with a vice chair as a single individual, a, a single point of responsibility uh, for non-federal account activities. 
Do you think it's important for us to answer uh, the vice chair question for you so that the party has the greatest range of uh, options available to it in order to uh, be able to operate the way it wants to? Uh, Commissioner, I think that the party is comfortable with all three of the options presented. And from the perspective of the party, it's really uh, uh, the party's focus is to uh, um, have this issue resolved um, so that it can begin uh, resuming its uh, normal state party activities and focus on uh, fighting for improving the lives of the people of Illinois, which is really its core function. Um, so to answer your question directly, uh, we would be comfortable if the commission only addressed uh, the special committee structure. If the commission prefers to address uh, other options as well, we're also comfortable with that approach. Uh, our primary interest is in uh, having a resolution to this question. Great. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Commissioner Trainer. Are there any more questions for council? I, I, I'm sorry to go back, council. Um, I, I'm intrigued by what you said about removing the pot. If we take away Congresswoman Kelly's ability to appoint to the special committee, and I wonder if that sufficiently um, addresses the governance issue. So I'm not. I'd like to. I wonder if OGC can weigh in on that or if we would um, need some additional time to be able to consider that aspect of it. I know that we have um, your deadline is July 6th. So we do not have another um, open meeting prior to that time period. But um, that, that's a point that's interesting and I, I would like to get OGC's feedback uh, and thoughts in regards to that. And it's a little bit short notice now, but I'm turning to council, she's smiling. So I'm turning to council and feel free to say that, um, but I, and I'm perfectly comfortable with you saying, I need some more time to think about it. So uh, I think we probably would like more time, but I will just say, I think that the, with the way the special committee is structured with the majority already not appointed by the chair, that is only weighing slightly in favor. That's not really a significant factor uh, or a, the main factor, I think the personnel control and the possibility of overlapping personnel control is, is one of the key issues in that draft, in draft A. Thank you. Any further questions for uh, OGC or our council? I see head shaking no. Um, I think you all around done an excellent job of presenting everything today some really difficult questions before um, the commission. Um, but let me now turn, is there a motion? We have two drafts in front of us. Um, Commissioner Trainer. Madam Chair, if we could, I would like to hold this over. Um, I would like to uh, take a shot at, at making a couple of uh, tweaks to uh, draft B. Uh, so I'd like to hold it over if possible. And but the, I, I assume, are you requesting an extension from our, our requesters because we do not have another meeting oh, that, before that deadline date? That's that's right. I forgot about that. So, uh, Mr. Brown, would would uh, would the party be willing to uh, give the commission an extension to uh, be able to get to a consensus answer uh, to this question? Uh, Commissioner, we would be willing to give an ex uh, an extension, though we would underscore that from our perspective, this is an urgent and time sensitive question. I, I, I understand that. I, I, um, I prefer uh, draft B uh, as, as you've stated that you do as well. Uh, I think based upon some of the comments that you've made, um, I, I'd like to take a shot at making a few tweaks to it and see if I can't get a consensus among my colleagues. Certainly Commissioner, we welcome, we welcome that approach. With, oh, with before with that, that with, Go on, Commissioner Trainer. I just wanted to highlight, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I apologize, is that we still have a little bit of time that we could try to resolve this on tally. Um, uh, I'm, 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 I will actively work with my colleagues to see if we can find some way forward. Um, I, if, I'd like to say if there's an extension, maybe we don't need a long extension because we do have some time, but um, <laughs> I think I'm being coached into saying two weeks by the two fingers held up by Commissioner Cooksey. So um, I will allow staff and council to, if you would, 
work together to find out some time period. But I would really like to see if we can try to resolve this on tally. But of course, um, if you are considering an extension enough time so that we get to the next meeting, which the dates were recently announced. So I apologize for interrupting. Commissioner Trainer. please go ahead if you had something further. No, you've answered my question and, and, and that'll be plenty of time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unless there are any further, Commissioner Cooksey. Um, yeah, very briefly, Madam Chair. Um, of course. I think, I think given the deadline is a July, or the current deadline of this request is July 6th. I think we have a meeting on, an open meeting on July 8th. So I meant two days, not two weeks. Oh, I have an extension okay. possible. Uh, uh, so 48 hours essentially as an extension. <laughs> on the deadline of that um, request. Um, I, I'm also happy to try to resolve this on tally. So we, that wouldn't be necessary, but I think giving us the opportunity to have another open meeting if, if we can't uh, get that done would be helpful. I also think it would be helpful from my perspective to have, uh, frankly, the additional time if, if others wanna submit uh, additional comments uh, uh, in addition to the Congressional uh, Black Caucus PAC comment, I think, um, uh, as, as Commissioner Trainer moved, these documents were submitted late, and uh, I think it's, it's always good to give uh, the public the greatest opportunity possible to, uh, give, us, uh, to give us their feedback. I, I uh, echo what uh, the chair and what Commissioner Trainer said yeah. uh, about the, the helpfulness of that comment. So um, thank you very much. I just, uh, as, as the chair, I, I, in my mind, I thought I had July 13th as the next meeting. Um, <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. So if Madam Deputy could just confirm that for us, we might need more than two days is, is the reason I, I say this. Is You're, You are correct and I am wrong. Okay. Um, so maybe as opposed to the two and the, we should have a D for day, we can um, ask for maybe go back to that oh, two week time period if council would consider it. So we can just have a, a sufficient time to be able to resolve this. Um, Commissioner Cooksey is easier, eager to get back into the open meeting, but in my mind, I was like, 13, 13 sounds familiar. So um, we will ask that our staff reach out with council. You have already indicated the willingness, but to confirm the, the time frame, if you would, please. And with that, we will hold this matter over to the next open meeting with the intention and, and the strong goal of everyone to try to resolve this on tally. And I want to thank uh, council, thank my colleagues for the very helpful questions that we've had today and hopefully we can reach some resolution. So thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a motion to amend Directive 68 to include additional information and quarterly status reports to the commission. Uh, this is a memorandum from Commissioner Cooksey um, that was held over from the last open meeting. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cooksey, for your willingness to hold that meeting, the, your item over from the last one. Um, so if you would, I'm going to Turn this over to Commissioner Cooksey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate appreciate that. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, this proposal and to make a brief presentation, just summarizing. <clears throat> excuse me, the substance of it. Uh, the, as you said, the issue is more fully laid out in the memorandum uh, that I circulated to all my colleagues, and that uh, has been made part of the agenda. Uh, I hope people who are interested will take the time to to read it more fully, but. Directive 68, I think, as everyone knows, is the, is the brainchild of our colleague, Commissioner Walter. Uh, it's a policy that, you know, in essence, tries to keep the commission and, more importantly, the commissioners accountable for uh, our workload and, uh, and doing the work of the agency. Um, one of the things it requires is quarterly status of enforcement reports. So these are reports compiled by uh, our very capable attorneys of the Office of General Counsel, and they track how the commission is performing on its workload and they track the, the status of the various enforcement matters in the building. It's essentially our quarterly report card. Uh, so for example, the status of enforcement reports, I give the commission uh, a list of all the pending matters uh, that we have, uh, including those that are imperiled by the statute of limitations, for example. Uh, there's another list of matters that have been pending before the commissioners uh, for over 12 months uh, without a vote. There's another list of uh, tracking matters that we've uh, moved along further along in the uh, enforcement process and, and where they are. Um, they provide a lot of useful statistics for us about our caseload, about how we're managing that caseload, how we've performed uh, uh, relative to previous years and where we're sort of falling behind. Um, I think these reports are very useful. Now they are mostly internally facing, but there are, there are limited uh, uh, versions that are external 
uh, externally facing for the public as well. And they really help the commission focus uh, as we monitor our workload and, and uh, helps uh, the chair uh, and the vice chair and, and all the commissioners sort of uh, uh, home in on what, what are the most pressing matters before us. The, there's a problem though. And the problem is that as they're currently being compiled, these reports are not accurate. There are inaccuracies or uh, problems with how they're, how they're uh, uh, put together. They list cases in the wrong place or in the wrong categories and they misstate what some of the case's statuses are. Um, and as a result of doing that, they skew some of our statistics and skew some of the, some of the lists we have. Um, they're, they're inaccurate for, I think, of a specific reason, which is that they don't account for a particular category of cases that we have at the commission. Uh, ones that in my memo I've called zombie cases, but that others refer in the building as split but not closed cases. Uh, that sort of defy the existing categories in these reports. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, these are cases where the commission has considered and deliberated on a case in the executive session and a closed session. We have voted on the merits of all the issues uh, in the case and failed to generate the necessary four votes under our statute to resolve the case. And then further, we, uh, we don't have four votes to close the file and to make the matter public. Uh, so as a result, these cases that have been uh, fully adjudicated just sort of hang around the commission, right? Like a zombie, they've been resolved internally, they're done, but they're stuck in the agency and they're not made public because uh, a group of commissioners refuses to allow us to inform the parties and the public about, about the outcome. So uh, over the last few years, especially this year, this category of, of cases of split but unclosed cases has grown a lot. Uh, since the beginning of the year, as my office calculated, it's grown 225%. Um, and as that number continues to grow, these cases become harder and harder to keep track of. Uh, and they are going to make our reports more and more inaccurate and make the statistics look worse and worse and worse, I think, in an unjustifiable way. So uh, the fact of the matter is just that our, our enforcement reports aren't designed for this. Um, they were, it was never contemplated that we would need to keep track of this sort of this kind of case. Um, and uh, as a result, we have in the reports as they stand today, cases that have been fully adjudicated that end up in parts of the report that are just wrong and where they don't belong. So for example, I think it's inaccurate to put a case that the commission has fully deliberated on and voted on in a category of cases titled cases pending without a commission vote for 12 months. But that's what we do. We have, there are cases in that category that that have been voted on, and yet we hold them in statistics of cases that haven't been voted on. So the result is, is just these inaccuracies. It also becomes, frankly, more difficult to track these split but unclosed cases with, with on a regular basis, especially as the number uh, grows. And so to address this, that's my amendment's very simple. It just creates a new category in our quarterly enforcement reports uh, to better track these cases. It brings these cases out of the incorrect categories, lists them in a new category, uh, this helps improve the accuracy of the reports, it helps improve, improve the accuracy of our statistics. Uh, it helps us, again, keep track of these things over time, especially as there are more of them. And uh, I mean, that's pretty much the sum of the amendment. I think, it, I think it's fairly uncontroversial. Uh, I think, you know, the, I won't speak for them. They can comment if they'd like. The Office of General Counsel, I think, though, has indicated that this would, on net, likely be a, a helpful change and not overly burdensome for them to track as they compile these reports for us. It doesn't implicate any confidentiality issues. Uh, and in my view, it would really improve the usefulness of, this, uh, of these reports. Uh, I also understand the Office of General Counsel has suggested a slight wording change to my amendment uh, uh, regarding uh, the nature of the, of the votes and how we categorize these cases. And I'll, I'll incorporate that uh, that uh, tweak to the language in a motion to uh, adopt this. And I, I appreciate their, their review and help on this. So um, that, that is, uh, that's the, the sum of my presentation. I appreciate all my colleagues' attention. Thank you, Commissioner Cooksey. Uh, there any discussion regarding the, the memorandum or the statements made today? Commissioner Weintraub. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was such a funny comment, Commissioner Cooksey, when you said, oh, this is completely uncontroversial. You know that's not true. You know that's not true. 
This is just a reprise of the policy statement that um, our colleagues offered a few weeks ago, and I expect that it will meet the same result. And then who knows, in a few weeks, we'll get a new document. First, we had a policy statement, then we had a directive. This goes to a fundamental disagreement about when a case is done. And, and you know, you say, well, you're done with it, so therefore the case is done. Well, maybe other commissioners aren't done with it. Um, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't agree with your categorization. I'm not gonna repeat everything that I said at the, the last time this topic came up, uh, your 225% scare number. Uh, I appreciate that you also acknowledge that that's 13 cases. So it is not, uh, the sky is not falling. Uh, there are plenty of cases that continue to be closed uh, and continue to be closed with my vote, uh, even, even this, this very week. I, uh, I appreciate your invocation of Justice Brandeis' commitment to sunlight. I will remind you of that the next time we have a dark money case, um, but uh, I will uh, not be able to uh, support the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Weintraub. Any further comment or discussion from colleagues? Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Walther. Uh, so I welcome good luck at uh, and approving what we're doing and uh, I've been interested in that for some time. There's uh, also another matter uh, in a motion that I've uh, prepared and it's on file. Uh, I decided to pull that because I, uh, wanted to be able to consider uh, the other motion that's on file as well. And then I realized now that that motion was not held up and, and it's before us today for consideration. But in any event, um, I think there's work to be done in there, in that area and some others as well as, as pointed out in the uh, draft that I prepared. So my suggestion is that perhaps we could uh, <clears throat> meet and uh, see if we can get some agreement on some of these points but it's premature for me to support it today. Thank you, Commissioner Walter. Um, I, I appreciate the, the, the weigh in and feedback of all colleagues. I, and, and I also appreciate that the start off Commissioner Cooksey um, thanked Commissioner Walter because I was on your staff when you created this, <laughs> this list. And um, I'm gonna call out uh, your formal counsel, Tom Anderson. He, he had many, many hours going through this. And I thank Tom for helping me more times over um, as we were preparing this for you. I do see the purpose of the quarterly reports, but I see that this is just, if the intent is to help staff, staff already has access to all of this information and is well aware of everything. If this is an attempt to highlight things for outside people outside of the building, then I think the efforts today or previous efforts have accomplished that. Um, but I'm concerned about the possibility and of, of, I really am concerned about reverse engineering. I, I, there, there's a purpose of redacting these reports um, to make sure that the public um, is not able to, um, to, to find out, the to break the confidentialities that we're bound to. And uh, there's already a level of redaction that still presents concerns to me that it makes it possible. Um, I think by doing something further or adding this category, I think that we're, we're risking it even, even more so. So based on that and some of the comments, I'm not at a place to support the motion today, but I do understand from Commissioner Walter that there is a desire to maybe look at look at it a little bit further. So I'm not sure how I take that if that was a request to hold over or if there is a willingness to hold over, I, um, I look at Commissioner Cooksey. Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Trainer. I wanna thank Commissioner Cooksey for, for bringing this forward. And I wanna thank Commissioner Walther for uh, actually uh, having created Directive 68. I think it, it is very informative to the public about what the commission is doing. Um, and I think that Commissioner Cooksey's uh, proposal uh, does nothing more than shed more uh, sunshine on the activities that are going on inside the commission. Um, these proceedings are already 
uh, cloaked and guarded enough as it is uh, to where even the complainants and the respondents aren't really fully informed of what the commission is doing uh, with the cases that we deal with. And so I think just giving them some modicum of understanding of what the commission is doing uh, is very helpful for the public whom we all work for to know that the commission is in fact uh, doing its job. Uh, I also think that uh, putting this particular uh, category of cases uh, in our status uh, reports would allow us to know what cases we need to go back and review. Uh, my understanding is that these cases are, uh, as Commissioner Weintraub said, she doesn't think that these cases are finished and that there's still work to be done on these cases. And so I think it's important for the commission to know what those cases are, how many there are, and if and when any of those cases will be revisited. Um, because as I said last time, uh, of the cases that we've handled since I've been on the commission uh, that would fit into this category, uh, we have not revisited those and we have not had further discussion on those. So if the purpose of holding these cases in a zombie status is to continue to work on them, uh, I think it's important for us to know that. And I think it's important for us to be able to look and see how many of those cases we have and figure out whether or not we can resolve those. So with that, I will obviously be supporting uh, Commissioner Cooksey's um, uh, uh, amendment to Directive 68, and I'm prepared to make a motion uh, to uh, move adoption of it uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you, Commissioner Trainer. I, I do have one question. Where do we stop? Because on I'm looking on the website where we have the redacted ones right here, and it's pages and pages of blank. So I'm not sure how helpful. But one of the points that I noted is is the column also has held over. And do we get to the point where we start adding who's holding things over or is that worthy for the public to know about as well? And I'd like to suggest that we use another term besides zombie um, <laughs> because we do have zombie packs. Uh, and I think it's a great little catchphrase for all of us out here that are, are fans of The Walking Dead, which would include myself. And that's my, my uh, pop thing for the day. But um, it, it's, it, it's just, it just seems like it's an effort to just try to get someone to tag it into the, into the paper. And it's not really, I think, helping the issue that we're here. But if, if we wanna look at really amending Directive 68 to help the public understand how things are happening, um, one of the things that I thought was super helpful is that Commissioner Walker had a held over and we can look at some of these cases that have held over dates for years. Do we start looking at saying what commissioners requested to hold over or what caucus might have requested to hold over? Manager? Yes, Commissioner Cookson. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think I can respond to that and I can respond to some of the things Commissioner Weintraub um, said as well. I mean, I think it, obviously the chair would like to submit her own amendments to Directive 68. I love the opportunity to have those and discuss those. I think, um, uh, and we could have a discussion with OGC about whether that additional information would need to be redacted or, or not be. I think, you know, again, the, the, the bottom line or the most important thing, and this goes to Mr. Weintraub's point, is that I, what I haven't heard is any denial uh, or explanation that these reports are accurate, that they, I, I, does anyone, I, I don't know if any of my colleagues disagree with my statement that cases in which the commission has voted should not be in a category that says matters pending before the commission for 12 months without a vote. I, does anyone, I'm not sure I've heard anyone who says that that's, that's, that's correct. That's the right category that should be. Maybe Commissioner Weintraub's raising her hand. Maybe she thinks it should be uh, uh, in a list of categories, matters pending before the commission without a vote. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think that's uh, uh, misleading. I think in statistics that say that have cases pending before the commission, I think that makes them look like we're not doing our jobs. Um, I understand Commissioner Weintraub thinks 13 Cases is a small number. I'm, I'm sure I can find 13 respondents who don't, uh, who, uh, don't think it's a, a little deal that their cases are still hanging around the commission and that uh, they haven't been told about the outcome of it. Uh, and I think it's just, it's a, it's just a 
mostly an internally facing change. I mean, ultimately, yes, there will be a, a, a list, a blank list with just numbers in a left-hand column under this in the public facing version of this document. But really it's, it's to help us keep track of this again, growing number of cases. As we've talked about in the past, some of these cases that are, that are still around, the statutes of limitations are run. It's, it's boggling to me that we can't close these cases and move on, even if we disagree about what the underlying merits were, it's over. Uh, and, and as Commissioner Trainer said, you know, I think there are offices that keep internal running lists of these matters. I, I, we can, we can uh, burden the already overly burdened secretary's office, I guess, to find these matters. But you know, if we can just keep a running list internally, keep track of, of this, the, the circumstances of these cases, I just think it would help us work more efficiently. So, I mean, I, if there's an alternative to try to make these, these reports more accurate, I'm, I'm certainly open to it. But I think I haven't heard any denial or any explanation that says that, that as we are currently compiling these cases, this is, this is a good way to do it. We shouldn't change it. This is the right presentation uh, of, of this information. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I've talked to Commissioner Walther offline about his Directive 68 proposal. I'm very interested in that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I would have to defer to him whether he's asking to hold this over. If he's not asking, I, I, I would like to, to vote on it. But if, if he's asking, I'll always respect another commissioner's request to hold something over. Uh, but ultimately, this is just a small incremental change to make our reports less inaccurate, maybe affirmatively accurate, so that, uh, so that we inside the building, and to a small extent, those outside the building know what we're actually doing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cooksey. Any further commissioner discussion? Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Walton. Uh, thank you. Yes, I am. Um, when we put that document together and you and Tom uh, worked uh, so assiduously for so long, and, and probably there was some uh, mumbling uh, in the, in, in the uh, in directed against uh, where I was sitting, but nevertheless- There, there was, there, there got, was. <laughs> but it got done. And I'm proud about it. And I think it's uh, maybe less helpful than I would have hoped. Um, to address the one issue on the to here, the length of time that was important to me then was to say, all right, this matter is before the commissioners now. It's been voted upon. It can be voted. It, it, it's been voted upon by all the other entities all that is necessary to be done is to call uh, a meeting and have a vote. And that to me was designed so that there would be enough, you can call it shame or disgruntlement or whatever it is, to actually make us do what we're supposed to do without this information. And that is accurately and quickly vote. And so we still don't do that. And obviously it's not working for that for that reason. I have some proposals to make and I have one that's not included yet, but I want to include it by the time we vote on my suggestions. I'd be tickled to work with the, um, you know, Commissioner Cooksey or anybody else to, um, maybe we could meld these, maybe we can't, but uh, take another look at um, maybe tightening that um, column uh, or maybe a uh, uh, adopting uh, the proposal that it's, you know, is, is presented now. But, but I promise that we won't be asking you to do any of the new column business. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for the comments, Commissioner Walther. Um, I believe, uh, I think we need some clarification. Um, Commissioner Cooksey would like a vote on this motion. And of course we want to proceed with that, but I understood that there was, I understood that you were asking to, to hold this over for additional consideration. So if you could just clarify for the, the commission, did, would you, are you requesting to hold over? Or are you prepared to move forward today? No, I request to hold over. Okay. There's Thank one you. other aspect that I want to add to it when it comes to vote. Okay. Um, with that request to hold over, Commissioner Cooksey, I appreciate your being willing to hold this over for the next meeting. We will have it scheduled for our next open meeting. Um, and hopefully we can 
um, move this forward. Um, and there has been a significant outpour of commissioners willing to work together to, to work on some resolutions. So let's move towards that. The next item that we have on our open meeting agenda, excuse me, is also Commissioner Cooksey. Uh, it is the proposed statement of policy regarding the disclosure of vote certifications relating to litigation. So I will turn over the, the floor to you, Commissioner Cooksey. Please proceed. Very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to make another brief presentation uh, in support of this proposed policy statement. Uh, the Federal Election Commission's mission uh, is to bring transparency to our campaign finance system, of course, and as a federal government agency accountable to the public, uh, we rightly hold ourselves to a, a high standard when it comes to disclosure and accountability. For many years, we've maintained a robust disclosure policy when it comes to our enforcement matters. The commission, we, you know, here we make an effort to give the public significant insights into the workings of this government agency and to make available all sorts of documents from our enforcement cases, including among other things, uh, the complaints, response materials, correspondence we have with the parties, reports from the Office of General Counsel and the vote tallies for each of the matters that, uh, that are closed that show what the commission voted on. And more importantly, in my view, how each commissioner voted uh, indeed, disclosing those last items, the vote tallies, isn't simply a matter of our agency policy, it's also the law. Uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, the FEC, like all government agencies, has a legal obligation to make public the individual votes of commissioners in every agency proceeding. That's 5 U.S.C. Section 552, which again, I'll just read, states that each agency having more than one member shall maintain and make available for public inspection a record of the final votes of each member in every agency proceeding, end quote. Uh, currently though, there uh, is a category of final agency actions that is not being shared with the public on a regular basis. And that is votes that the commission takes on whether to authorize the agency to enter into litigation. Under the Federal Election Campaign Act, any vote to authorize the agency to engage in litigation whether it's offensive litigation to enforce the law or by filing a civil suit or defensive litigation to defend the agency in a delay suit or in a challenge to one of our agency actions, it requires the approval of four or more commissioners. The commission votes on these authorizations all the time. Uh, the FEC is a frequent flyer in, in federal court. Usually we have about a dozen or sometimes more than that court cases going on at, at any one time. Uh, but Currently, the FEC does not, as a matter of course, make our litigation votes available to the public. Uh, to be sure, we respond to specific FOIA requests for these vote certifications. Um, in the past, we've turned these vote certifications over to members of Congress that have asked for them. And even occasionally, the commission has made uh, specific vote tallies uh, available to the public on an individual basis in, in specific cases, either on the motion of a specific commissioner, or sometimes they're included as part of the vote certifications on the underlying enforcement matter. So when that enforcement matter is made public, the, the vote on the related litigation is often included in there. But in general, in most instances, the public is left totally in the dark about how the commission voted on the authorization uh, for agency litigation. And in my view, that, that should change. I think the public has a right to this information. I think it's important. I think it, it helps hold us accountable. And uh, you know, questions about whether to enter into litigation are some of the most important decisions that we make. They include decisions about whether to file enforcement suits, as I said, against individuals or political committees that we think broke the law. They include decisions to defend the agency or not to defend the agency in uh, delay suits related to uh, pending complaints. And they even include questions about, about uh, whether to appeal uh, particular court decisions that have ruled against the agency, including court decisions that have held our statutes or our regulations unconstitutional. Uh, I don't think the public should have to go through the trouble of submitting a FOIA request or depend on the initiative of individual commissioners in order to know how their campaign finance regulatory agency is, is working and how it's voting uh, 
in these very important decisions. I think people have a right and they deserve to have this information publicly accessible. Uh, and that's basically what my policy proposal does. It would make vote certifications available for anyone to find on our webpage as a, as a matter of course. In doing that, I don't think we will be prejudicing any agency litigation, nor do I think that we will be implicating any privilege or confidentiality concerns. This policy specifically allows for redactions to uh, these vote tallies as necessary. And if anything, I think you know, putting this information out there will actually improve our standing with the courts and, and expedite uh, a particular matters when uh, the agency chooses not to appear or fails to approve uh, uh, agency staff to appear in particular court cases. So, you know, I think we at the FEC need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We shouldn't be hiding decisions that we make from public scrutiny. We are government officials, we are public servants. And I, for one, don't have anything to hide. I'm happy to make my votes uh, on behalf of the agency public. So I think this policy will bring an even greater level of transparency to our work. It'll make us more accountable to the public for our actions. And I think that's our responsibility. Uh, as a federal government agency. So I hope, I hope my colleagues will join me in, uh, in supporting this and bringing our litigation votes into line with how we treat disclosure of documents and of vote tallies in other matters. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Cooksey. Uh, any discussion from our colleagues? Commissioner Weintraub? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit torn on this concept because I too am perfectly comfortable telling the public how I vote on these litigation matters. I have no qualms about doing so. And, uh, and as Commissioner Cooksey knows, have voted to do so. Um, uh, I am, this policy was not actually written with an eye towards attracting votes on the other side of the aisle. It's written in a con contentious fashion. It cites only to Republican statements on the topic. So if you were really interested in trying to get consensus on this, you would have come up with a different document. Um, I, I think, again, this is just a this is just a, a talking point. But, you know, as I said, the, the concept is one that I am uh, I'm tempted by. I, I'm not sure that I agree with you. And I think that there is, um, I, I am not, uh, I wanna be careful how I phrase this. Let's just say I'm not alone in thinking that there could be lit litigation ramifications towards releasing some of these votes. Um, so I am not prepared to support, well, I'm not certainly not prepared to support this, this document. Um, I am not prepared to support an overall policy. I will continue to um, uh, consider releasing uh, votes on a case by case basis as I have done in the past. Thank you, Commissioner Weintraub. Any further discussion? Madam Chair. Commissioner Freeman. So um, I think, as I've said publicly, uh, I, think it, I think it is an outrage that we do not tell federal courts that the commission has taken a position uh, in litigation matters. Uh, I think that the judiciary benefits from uh, having uh, two parties in front of it to uh, handle litigation. And when the commission decides not to appear, uh, I think that does a disservice to uh, the one of the other branches of government. And so uh, the fact that we can't get there to appear in these cases, uh, I think Commissioner Cooksey's uh, proposal here uh, is a nice compromise to at least allow for uh, notification that a vote on litigation has taken place uh, and would at least give the courts some information with regard to uh, what the commission's position is so that the courts know what they're dealing with. So I, I think this is a, a very fair proposal uh, and one that uh, sheds light on the activities, uh, again, of what the commission is doing. And I think the fact that um, Commissioner Weintraub is not gonna support this, I, I, I just find it interesting that an agency which is 
supposed to uh, be responsible for transparency and disclosure in government uh, wants to hide behind uh, a case-by-case basis as opposed to a broad-based uh, public disclosure of what we're doing inside the building. Thank you, Commissioner Trainer. Um, I would like, uh, I appreciate the, the, the proposal that has been filed by Commissioner Cooksey, but there he also acknowledged that it has been considered on a case by case basis. So in some effort, you are getting exactly what you want. Um, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable by the, I, I wanna say it in, in, a, in no, nothing to Commissioner Weintraub. Um, I wanna say it in a, in a more chair like manner that I, I think that the draft written um, was not an attempt to, to reach across the aisle but I do believe what you are attempting to do is something that does have across the aisle concerns. So I will not be supporting this draft, but I would be interested, interested in seeing the next draft um, that might include a little bit more reach across the aisle. I think what has been said by absolutely everyone that has spoken on this topic is that we all agree that the responsibilities for each and every one of us is to promote transparency and also to enforce the law. So we can move forward uh, with this um, so that we can move on to enforce the law in our closed meeting. And hopefully we can do something that will affect that Directive 68 chart that we're trying to, to, to revise as well. So I will not be supporting the draft today um, as it is prepared. Um, I appreciate your efforts, Commissioner Cooksey. Thank you for continuing to shed a light on this and the zombie um, cases that exist. So uh, I, I have nothing further. I wanna turn it to my colleagues. I'm not sure if there is a desire for a motion today or... Sure. Yes, Commissioner Cooksey. I don't know if any other colleagues want to speak. Otherwise, I would be prepared to make a couple additional brief comments, very brief comments, and then make a motion. But okay, I, I was getting ready to ask them if they had any more, but feel free to take the floor and go. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll get a couple of brief comments um, in response. I think um, with respect to Commissioner Weintraub's proposal of a case-by-case -case basis, I, I just don't, I think we just have a fundamental disagreement about whether the public should have to rely on government agents being willing to disclose their own actions. I don't think we should get to decide when we tell the public what we're doing here. I think we owe it to them. I think it's the law. Uh, and I think uh, as, a, as a matter of principle, it's something we here at the FEC especially uh, should be doing. So I think relying on the whims of four commissioners in a particular case, uh, uh, hoping that uh, no more than two of them are, in, you know, bashful about their votes uh, is not something that is uh, will be consistent with our mission and certainly not consistent with uh, public accountability embodied in FOIA and in, uh, and, and in our own statute. Uh, but I take, I take the point of uh, my colleagues that they might be interested in this policy, but maybe they're concerned about the wording or the, the preambular paragraphs of the, uh, of the proposed policy, I, I take that as an indication that maybe I could expect some, some red lines or some particular notes about what might get them to support that. I, I, if I don't get that, maybe, I, you know, rather than, rather than me guessing it, it is what it is that you need to get to yes, maybe you could just tell me. Uh, I guess if I don't get that, then maybe it's not a real offer. It's maybe uh, uh, to be seen or to be determined. But uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to make the presentation. I hope those watching will understand that uh, you know we're we're not we're not really uh, taking on uh, everything we could be to be as transparent as we as we might be with these very important decisions. I hope that we'll uh, continue to work towards that goal in the future, uh, if, assuming this vote goes the way I think it's going to go. So. Um, I guess with that, I'll, I'll say thank you in case there are any other comments. Otherwise, I, I'd be prepared to make a motion. There are more comments, Commissioner Cooksey. Um, before Commissioner Weintraub goes, um, 
it, it felt like there was a little shot fired when you said that you're waiting to see some red lines, but I don't recall any outreach to me individually to ask to see if I had any concerns or if I'd be willing to reach out and to talk to you about this. So I will not be supporting the draft as it stands today. If there are some edits that come from your office and attempt to uh, try to reach across to see if I would be willing to support it, then this version as it stands, I won't be able to support. I'd be happy to consider it or happy to have a discussion with you um, at another time to, to stop and talk about this. We all agree that transparency is important. And I believe we all agree that enforcing the law is equally important. And while it doesn't look like it's interesting you very much right now, um, I'm happy to talk with you at another time about moving that forward. So I apologize if I interrupted anyone. Commissioner Weintraub, you had your hand up and I spoke over spoke, so excuse me. I, I agree with everything that you just said, Madam Chair. So I, uh, I appreciate the uh, intervention. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I also did not uh, hear anything at all um, uh, about this proposal until it was made public. Um, there was absolutely no effort at outreach uh, on this to see whether there might be some interest in doing something like this. And as I've said, I have no qualms about disclosing my votes on these litigation matters. Um, and I've done so before, and I will stand on my long record on transparency. Um, for uh, I also particularly appreciate the chair's comments about our uh, enforcement mission. Um, there's uh, uh, one of uh, one of Commissioner Cooksey's documents. I think it's the other one uh, refers to the scandalous uh, uh, event when uh, there are not four votes to defend a. Um, uh, the position of the commission in litigation when it is driven by only three votes uh, and set by only three votes. Um, some of us think it's scandalous when we can't get four votes to enforce the law. Uh, and that's the real scandal of this agency and the one that the agency is routinely criticized for. Um, I'll stop there. Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Training. So I would just ask Commissioner Cooksey when he circulated this document, if he had any responses from our Democratic colleagues saying that they thought that it was an interesting proposal and, and that it needed some tweaks. Um, for me, this is a, a, a new uh, uh, paradigm that you put a proposal out and then reach out to individual uh, commissioners saying, hey, do you wanna work on this? I think the idea that Commissioner Cooksey put this out for all the commissioners to consider, if we had comments, I think it's incumbent upon us to reach out to Commissioner Cooksey after he's gone through the effort of, of putting this together. Uh, so in his defense, I appreciate that he put this out to the commission and that the commission had the opportunity to review it before it was put on uh, this particular agenda. And uh, those that had comments could have uh, forwarded those comments to him at that time, as opposed to announcing uh, here at the public meeting that, uh, oh, we're willing to work on this and uh, we find it offensive the way you've drafted it um, and, and attacking him in that manner. Um, that being said, with regard to Commissioner Weintraub's uh, last comment that she finds it offensive that uh, we can't get to four votes, uh, you know, that, that's the way the statute is designed, is to get to four votes. And if we can't get there, it's because we can't get there. And that's the way Congress wanted it to be. Uh, it is not uh, scandalous that we follow the law and have to have four votes. Oh. I, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Weintraub, I can appreciate Commissioner Trainer's efforts to, to speak in defense of Commissioner Cooksey, but he is quite able and has done a great job for himself today. But I will also note that Commissioner Cooksey and Commissioner Walter both mentioned that they were in discussion regarding the proposal that we just considered. So that was an effort to reach amongst colleagues to try to come up with a document that could have some successful votes. 
And quite frequently, when we're working in the, the, the arena of proposed policy statements or directives, we do, the individual that might be the main proponent does reach out to individuals to see if they can solicit some support. So I, I, if anything directed to me, I stand by what I said. So go right ahead, Commissioner Cook. Thank you. Well, Madam Chair, I, I thank you for bringing that up because that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Uh, uh, Commissioner Walter put out his proposed directive 68 uh, uh, amendment uh, or overhaul really, it was quite comprehensive uh, and I was interested in it. So I reached out to him to let him know that I probably wasn't fully on board, but I'd like to, you know, could you send me a Word document? Maybe we could have some red lines back and forth. I did that privately between us so that we could maybe facilitate something uh, before an open meeting vote. Um, so to, to answer Commissioner Train's original a question, uh, this was circulated a week ago, as is required under the directive to be on an open meeting agenda and to give offices the time necessary to, uh, to reflect on it, to think about it, have discussions on it. So um, it's disappointing that, uh, uh, but also hopeful that, you know, we're not gonna be able to approve this today, but I, I will hope we can look forward to, again, maybe some indication about what the specific problems are rather than uh, leaving the, uh, the authoring office to, to guess at, at what it is that might might satisfy uh, offices that are interested in the, in the overall topic but uh, but uh, have problems with the, with the specific document uh, but uh, at any rate again I I think um, I, I thank Commissioner trainer uh, for his for his weighing in I, I agree with uh, with everything that that he uh, expressed thank you Thank you to both of you. Um, I hope that that sentiment that you just expressed carries on to our future closed meetings. So um, if there is a motion. Madam Chair. Commissioner Cooksey. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the adoption of the proposed statement of policy regarding the disclosure of vote certifications relating to litigation which is agenda document 21-29-A. Thank you very much. Commissioner Cooksey has presented a motion. Is there a discussion on this motion? None. We'll call the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 Regretful, regretfully, no. We do have a, a situation where we are waiting for the vice chair's vote um, before the close of today, which would be dispositive for, um, or could be. Well, no, it will not. So, excuse me, I apologize on that. We are waiting for the vote of the vice chair. I think I'm having a, a brain freeze right now. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Calvert to jump in before it goes completely solid. Madam Chair. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you've not called the vote, but if you heard it the way I did, <laughs> with two in favor and three opposed, uh, the vice chair's vote would not be dispositive. Thank you for the math lesson, Mr. Calvert. I understood exactly what you were saying, but I have not called the vote, so I shall do that. There are two votes in favor, Commissioner Cooksey and Commissioner Trainer, and three votes against. Commissioner Weintraub, Walter, and myself. And thank you again uh, for that gentle nudge, Mr. Calvert. We are awaiting the vote for um, the vice chair, but the motion fails. <laughs> and um, with that, uh, we do have one remaining item on the agenda, which is management or administrative matters. I see Ms. Orock. Um, so Ms. Orock, are there any management or administrative matters the commission needs to dis discuss today? There are none, Chair. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Stand by.